Come, let us worship the Lord who turns the ordinary into extraordinary and fills our hearts with his steadfast love. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made and wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope and pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading the way in these last few weeks of December. Praise the Lord. I made it. You made it. And you know what they said about you. You know what happened to you. But guess what? The Lord knew too. But you're still here and you're still standing. And so I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, through the intervention of the Holy Spirit, that you continue letting the Lord lead you as we march down this final lap of 2024. And I hope that I see you in 2025, just like you hope to hear from me in 2025, because no day is promised. Keep that in mind. So every time you wake up, there is always something that the Lord needs you to do and desires for you to do for his will, for the glorification of his kingdom. So. Let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from Psalm 96 verses one through four. Psalm 96 verses one through four reads as follows. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise he is to be feared above all gods. And we definitely hope that you are giving God the glory this season. I know many of you are like, like myself are getting ready for shopping and decorating and cooking and eventually cleaning. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you're, you're doing that with joy. But there are some out there that are not in the place that you are. We wanna pray for you right now because I know it's hard. I know you're stressed out and you're trying to wonder what's going to happen this holiday season, how it's going to look, how it's going to be remembered. Why don't you give all that to God and let God work that out for you? Why don't you do that? Why are you carrying so much? That's the question. And when you give it all to the Lord, he has an answer for you. It's one of joy. It's one of peace. And it's one that you can definitely learn from. So we're going to pray for y'all right now because we know that you're out there. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of thanks and awe as we enter this season of celebrating the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of Emmanuel, God with us, who stepped down from the majesty of heaven into the frailty of our world to bring hope, peace, joy, and salvation. Lord, in this holy season, we remember the wonder of that first Christmas night shepherds in the fields, angels singing of your glory, and the humble manger that cradled the Savior of the world remind us that your ways are not our ways. You chose to come to us in humility and love, showing us that your kingdom is one of grace and truth. We lift up those who are hurting this Christmas season, those who mourn bring comfort. For those who are lonely, bring companionship. For those who are struggling financially or physically, be their provider and healer. Lord, may the light of Christ shine brightly in every dark corner, bringing renewed hope to weary souls. We also pray for our hearts, Lord. In the busyness and distractions of the season, help us to focus on the true meaning of Christmas the birth of our Savior. Keep us mindful of the immense love you have for us, demonstrated in that tiny infant who would one day bear the weight of the cross for our sins. May our lives reflect the joy of the season as we gather with family and friends. May our conversations and actions be filled with the love of Christ. Let us shine your light to the world around us, proclaiming the good news of the great joy to we all to all we encounter. Father, as we await the return of our King, help us to live as faithful ambassadors of his love and truth. 
and may this Christmas season renew our sense of all for the miracle of your incarnation and inspire us to share that love with the world that is slowly losing its way and one that is desperately in need of you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our King. Amen. I do hope and pray that you're having an outstanding holiday season. I pray that the family has gotten home safely, and I pray there's peace in the house. Yes, we're still in this post-election season, and uh, there are some things that many families are still resolving as they um, work to finish out this year, so I hope that you do not let the ways of the world ruin a family God gave you one that you were blessed with and made steward of keep that in mind as you hang up the decorations and prepare the Christmas cards and make the ham keep that in mind but our topic today is from the ruins of a stump to the reign of a savior and we're in Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 5 Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 5 reads as follows a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and, of, and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with, the right, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the reading of your already blessed word. We ask you, Lord, to help us dive into your word as always, to pick out what we need to learn. Help us identify the core truths in your word always. And most importantly, Father, help us apply it to our lives where needed. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We are looking at the vision of Isaiah. We are in chapter 11, where he begins to bring into focus the coming Messiah. And when we see this, we see this beginning from a stump. We see it coming in from a place that many people believed was over, the stump of Jesse. The Davidic line's source. And so when we look at this scripture, there are some observations to be made that I want you to consider as we make our way through this Advent season awaiting the day to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And that first observation being the source of hope. We see here in verse one, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. Here's the first truth here we can get from this. God does not, he does, he does his best work in what looks like ruin. God does his best work in what looks like ruin. A tree stump is dismissed in the grand picture of nature. It's a remnant of what used to be there. I don't have to see the tree to know there was a tree there because of the tree stump. You've been through the woods. You might have tripped over one. It's roots coming in and out of the ground and you have this round area there cleanly shaven from a cut or maybe a recent weather disaster. But God's talking about the family tree of Jesse. Cut down and thought to be done, that is, the line of King David. This is where we have to remember 
God's promises because when you look back at 2 Samuel 7, starting at verse 11, where God is telling David how he will establish his house, he finishes in verse 16 with this. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So when God says a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, let's remember the shoot in the scene here, new life from old roots. And when he says that will happen, that will happen. Look at the text. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. So God is telling Isaiah and us as the readers of his word, that from a family tree that will start to be cut down on the outside, the roots are still alive on the inside. And because the roots are still alive, a shoot will come up from what was cut down. And there's some hope here. Don't miss it. Don't be passive with your family issues this holiday season because they may look like stumps. I guarantee you there's some people out there right now who have some stumps in the family, some trees that were cut down, and there's a, a remnant of what was, but no one really pays attention because who pays attention to a tree stump? It, do, it doesn't bear fruit. It, 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 there's nothing growing, does not provide shade. There's, there's nothing there but what used to be there. And you might talk about that. There's a tree on my home property that we talk about all the time. And that's what we see here. There's life rooted in God's foundation. And like King David, he has a plan for your legacy as well to last. And that's where God's grace through Christ Jesus comes in because without Jesus, that chance, that opportunity is not there. And maybe you're dealing with something right now that's rocking your family. You might think your family tree has been cut completely down and there's nothing left but a stump. But I am here to tell you to have hope in the Lord. Because if God can bring back to life a family tree, thought to be done thanks to exile, wars, judgments. He can supply all your needs in that area. And when the world writes off something is finished, God sees the potential for resurrection. The stump of Jesse reminds us that no situation, no life, no failure is beyond his ability to redeem. So if you're sitting here today thinking about a broken relationship, a lost dream, Something maybe might be in spiritual drought. Remember this. God brings life out of the barren. You have hope and keep it at all cost. But we not only see the source of hope here, we see the nature of hope. We see that in verses 2 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord. Now in Hebrew, Lord used here is Yahweh equaling God will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Here's the second truth. Jesus, the promised Savior, leads with divine wisdom and unparalleled power. We await the celebration of his birth because we know God has given Christ all that is needed and Christ is complete. Isaiah reveals the unique qualifications of the coming Messiah by describing the fullness of the Spirit resting upon him. From the Spirit of the Lord we see three spirits. These spirits mentioned here are what the Hebrew defines as God's creative or sustaining power. So when we read this, we read this with that in mind. God has given Christ his son the wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of him, and Christ delights in it because he desires, what his desire is, is that of the Father. 
How do we know that John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. Because of Christ's connection to the Father, Father in such a manner, we thank God that he sent his Son to save us from our depravity. And because of this hope that we have in Christ Jesus, we should be looking to have the same nature that he has because of who he is to God and who Christ is to us. The Apostle Paul broke it down this way in Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And because we acknowledge him, we acknowledge the Spirit's attributes in him in action. We acknowledge the wisdom and understanding. Don't you know Jesus has perfect insight into the thoughts and intentions of every heart. Unlike earthly leaders who rely on human reasoning and limited perspective, his decisions are rooted in divine wisdom. He sees the big picture and knows the best course of action for every situation. We acknowledge his counsel and might. The Savior doesn't just offer sound advice. He offers what he has is the power to accomplish his plans. His strength ensures his counsel is carried out flawlessly. He is not just a strategist. He is the mighty warrior who, who guarantees and brings victory in your life over your life in the life of those who accept him as Lord and King. We acknowledge his knowledge and fear of the Lord. Jesus walks in perfect obedience and reverence towards the Father. His leadership is grounded in holiness and he delights in fulfilling the will of God. This reverence for God ensures that his reign is righteous and pure. And his leadership goes beyond human limitations. Verse 3 says, He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. The prophet Isaiah emphasizes that the Savior will not judge by the appearance or hearsay. Human leaders often make decisions based off of the outward evidence or incomplete information, but Jesus goes deeper. He judges with truth and righteousness because he knows the heart. We read that in John 2.25. He isn't influenced by bias, manipulation, or external pressures. His decisions are just and fair, rooted in his perfect understanding. I thank God every day that his grace is given freely and not on any human merit based system. The gift that Christ gives, he gives freely and cannot and should not be cheapened by anyone who thinks that their work replaces the absolute surrender and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be duplicated by what they say about anyone and about anything because his understanding is in the bigger picture of anything and in everything at any given time and is not restricted to human subjectivity. But not only do we have here the source of hope, not only do we have here the nature 
of hope, but we also have the justice in hope. Verses, verses four and five read, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteous will, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be in his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Here is your third truth. Jesus' reign will be marked by justice and righteousness that this world has never seen. Isaiah paints a vivid picture of the Messiah's rule, one characterized by fairness, truth, and unshakable integrity. Unlike few flawed human governments, Jesus' kingdom will restore balance to the scales of justice and bring equity to those who have long been overlooked. Hey, who do you know that's been overlooked this year? Maybe they feel unjust in the court system, may feel unjust with their friends and family. Who do you know this year who feels like they're quote unquote oppressed? Because Jesus is there to give justice to the oppressed. Isaiah declares that the Savior will act with righteousness towards the needy and justice for the poor. This is radical departure from the norm of the earthly rulers. We all see them. We all know them. We all hear them. We often favor the powerful and ignore the cries of the vulnerable. The needy and the poor, often left without advocates, will find their defender in the Messiah. Jesus' justice is not reactive, but proactive. He actively seeks out those who are suffering and delivers them from their plight. In the Gospels, we see this fulfilled as Jesus defends the marginalized, lifts up the downtrodden, and brings dignity to those in society who have been rejected. We read that in Matthew 3, 5 through 6, write this down, Luke 4, 18 through 19. And then we see his power over the wickedness. Isaiah describes the Messiah's authority with a striking imagery. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. What we see here is the rod of his mouth referring to the power of the words of Christ. His spoken truth dismantles the lies and corruption, leaving no room for evil to hide. And then we see the breath of his lips highlighting his divine authority to bring judgment. Wickedness will not stand under his reign, and his judgment will be swift and final. This is the Savior who not only saves, but also purifies, ensuring that his kingdom is a place where righteousness prevails. Not just goodness, but righteousness. And speaking of that, he's clothed in it, along with faithfulness. And the prophet concludes with a powerful image that righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness will be it, it, his, the sash around his waist. They're not just quali qualities of the reign of Christ. They are integral to his very being. When you think of righteousness, every decision he makes is morally, morally pure, aligned with God's holiness. When you think of faithfulness, he is steadfast and reliable, rely fulfilling every promise and never failing his people. This is the kind of king that we long for, one whose character and actions are perfectly consistent and trustworthy. This is the vision, the prophecy that we lean on, knowing that it came true. There are so many people out here in 2024 that want to prophesy, but not proclaim the gospel of Christ. I don't know why, I don't know where it began, but it was back in the, it's like back in the 90s all over again, where everybody wanted to be a rapper. Everybody wanted to get a deal. Now everybody wants to be a prophet. Everybody wants to prophesy. Why? Because they feel like that 
power can be directed towards them and not towards Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you today that the only vision, the only prophecies that you need to be worried about is not the ones telling you break through this and break through that and that you don't get a million dollars tomorrow. The only ones you need to worry about are the ones that were fulfilled here in, the, in, in God's word and the ones that are yet to be fulfilled. This is where we are. This is where you need to be. Looking forward to celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not about a bunch of mumbo jumbo knowledge about, well, why do we celebrate it this way for Christmas? Or why are we even doing Christmas? Well, what about all this stuff over here and the, the holidays this and the background that? It takes away from the significance that I, like you, are celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior. Do you realize that? You get lost in all that worthless, useless knowledge. It doesn't make you smarter. It doesn't make you wiser. It takes away from your worship. It takes away from your time with the Lord. Don't let the world do that. They will smart you right out of Jesus. And you'll be wondering why in the end you don't have that peace. You'll be wondering why you feel so distant from the Lord. Because you're, fo you're trying to follow the world's rules on how to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. Let's just celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. Leave the world out of it. If they want to be involved, then tell them the significance and why this is so important. Don't debate with them. They're just trying to tear you away from the joy that you have. And when you let them do that, then yeah, your salvation does get muddy. It does get a little, a little foggy. It's like putting milk in coffee. <laughs> but praise be to God, it's not permanent. You can get that out of your life and you can keep moving forward in your relationship with Jesus. So, until next time, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Be sure to visit our page on AIM Christian channel. Leave comments, leave a prayer request, and we would love to hear from you. Until then, Godspeed. You take care.